Hello and welcome to Death Drive Dialectics. I'm Tyler Moraz and I'm here with Nick Tolliver. Today we're going to be talking about Lacan's Objet Petit A and his conception of how desire functions in given subjectivity. If you like this video, make sure to give us a like and a subscribe and check out our other videos because you'll probably like them too. Oscar Wilde once famously said, there are only two tragedies in life. One is not getting what one wants, and the other is getting it. For those of us living in the consumerist cores of global capitalism, our experience definitely embodies Oscar Wilde's second tragedy, the tragedy of getting what one wants, particularly in the US, where most of its productive capacity is now outsourced to periphery nations. The US is the consumption capital of the world. Consumer spending in the U.S. far exceeds even the nation with the second highest spending rate. When commodities pervade our experience. Consumption defines many of our behaviors. Technologies of production and distribution have streamlined the consumption process, and computerized consumption has radically transformed the consumer experience. There's e-commerce, next-day delivery, customizable products, credit cards that allow us to spend as much as we'd like. So. Consumption has never been so convenient and pervasive. Anything we might want is literally at our fingertips, provided we have the money, of course. But what is so tragic about getting what one wants? Oscar Wilde provides us with an important insight into the paradoxical nature of desire within the human psyche and can help us understand the tragedy of our desire. Wilde's second tragedy suggests that what we want, the object of our desire, is always, in a sense, divided. On the one hand, there is the object as we imagine it and idealize it in our heads, otherwise known as the signifier. And on the other hand, there is the object in itself, the signified. Importantly, these two versions of the object are incommensurate, such that whenever we get what we want, we are always dissatisfied. There are, of course, countless examples that demonstrate the divided nature of objects and demonstrate the dissatisfaction we experience when we do get what we want. But we figured one of the best examples is the dream job, or the career goal. Throughout our entire lives, especially our formative years, from the moment we're born, middle school, high school, college, we are constantly asked what we want to do with our lives, what's our passion, what career we want to enter into, uh, what our dream job is. And consequently, we build our identities around it. Our desire begins to circulate around this supposed dream job, this eventual fulfillment or completion of our identities that we'll experience after schooling. Yet, once we do finally get that dream job, once we do obtain that oh-so-built-up object of our desire, the result is usually dissatisfaction. It might take a couple weeks, a couple months to set in, but one will almost always find a certain monotony, a certain realization that what was built up in their heads over many years isn't actually what they're experiencing right now. We're always searching for that dream job, but then when we get the dream job, it just becomes work. It's reduced to the everyday, to the mundane, to the Mondays, to the late nights. It loses its special status as the desired object and becomes the object that we have and then we begin to desire other dream jobs, promotions, changes in career, new educational opportunities. That final, truly satisfying job is always one pasture over. This brings us to the question, why is this the case? Why is Oscar Wilde's statement accurate? What gives consistency to his second tragedy, the tragedy of getting what one wants? Psychoanalysis would have it that the inevitable process of symbolization to which we are all subjected imparts on us a perspective or perception dominated by signifiers. Our entry into language forces us to relate to a divided world, a world where objects are supplemented by the signifier, which ultimately remains irreducible to the objects themselves. And of course by signifier here we mean words, concepts, language. The entities we use to refer to the objects in themselves. And so, despite appearances, the signifier permanently distorts the signified, the object, 
and we can never see through the signifier to attain a direct, unmediated view to the signifier. No matter how precisely we choose our words, no matter how accurate we try to be, language creates an unbridgeable gap between the signifier and the signified, and we, as subjects of language, are condemned to the side of the signifier, condemned to repeatedly fail to obtain or grasp the object, such is the alienating nature of language, and this alienation necessarily includes being alienated from ourselves, as yet another ungraspable, distorted object. In other words, language also divides us as subjects into two parts that are radically separated. These two parts are, in psychoanalysis, most commonly known as conscious and unconscious, or ego and unconscious. Bruce Fink in the Lacanian subject provides a great analysis of the subject's relationship to desire. Fink states, according to Lacanian theory, every human being who learns to speak is thereby alienated from her or himself, for it is language that while allowing desire to come into being, ties knots therein, and makes us such that we can both want and not want the same thing, never be satisfied when we get what we thought we wanted, and so on. Another uh, amazing quote from Todd McGowan can help us dive deeper into this relationship between signification and the subject. McGowan states, When the subject encounters the world of signification, it encounters an intractable absence. It always seeks something and yet finds nothing. The world of signification promises an answer it never delivers. And this is how it installs an absence at the heart of the desiring subject. There is no ultimate resolution for the subject's desire, just as there is no ultimate resolution to signification itself. Once the signifier emerges, absence inhabits every moment of subjectivity and establishes the structure of desire. Related to our divided subjectivity is another important aspect of desire, derived from our decentered position within language, and most clearly articulated when Lacan says that desire is always the desire of the other. This basically means that we are always asking or interpreting what the other desires, and in turn, making that our own desire. Why is this the case? Well, we are born into language, into a society with moral codes, principles, cultural norms, etc. Even before we are born, we have a place for us inscribed within language. We are given names. Parents build up expectations and desires for us. In this sense, language exists as an inherently external thing that nonetheless defines us and inhabits us. Whereas we might believe that we exert a certain control over language, that we speak through language, psychoanalysis insists that it's actually the reverse, that language speaks through us, that we are subjected to language. And so whether we are aware of it or not, our desire is always someone else's desire. This someone else is not necessarily another subject, like a parent or a peer, but can be embodied by cultural and societal values, morals and principles. Many of the commodities we desire and acquire are clear demonstrations of the other's desire. Before we purchase something, we always take into account, either explicitly or implicitly, what others will think and whether it fits into a certain standard or identity. A perfect example of how we always are desiring through the other is brands and brand name goods like Supreme or uh, Louis Vuitton or luxury cars. There's always a certain sense in which we're, we're seeking to impress someone external. Our desire is not purely for our own gratification, but in some way something that we can signify to someone else, something about ourselves, about our identities. And while this is certainly the case with luxury brands where we're trying to signify luxury to the other, this can also be the case with alternative styles, emo or hipster aesthetics. 
in their very rebellion against authority presuppose uh, an, an other that they are tr in relationship to. Psychoanalysis would insist that this behavior stems all the way back from our very birth, our relationship to our parents, in the sense that the subject or the child is always trying to gain recognition from the parents, always interpreting what the parents desire so that they, the, the child, may become the object of the parents' desire. And this is a behavior that we never grow out of, a behavior that stems straight into adulthood. We are always negotiating our desire through the other's desire, or always being recognized by the other. Our desire never functions outside some other. This is something you know I think about a lot. Um, when I play music in my car, I like to play my music loud enough that other people outside my car can hear it. I'm enjoying not only for myself, but I want them to see me enjoying. Or I get enjoyment through knowing that they are listening to my music, which they probably don't care about. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Plenty of people are, are blasting the music so as to get the recognition of others uh, or to have others recognize that they are enjoying or that they are desiring subjects. But this is also very clearly demonstrated in more collective acts of desire in the case of movies or uh, eating. Lots of people can relate to the case in which you might have already seen a movie, but you are definitely more than willing to re-watch the movie with your friend who has not seen it, just so that you can see their reaction, or that so you can see the other desire. In that sense, we are constantly desiring through the other. And same thing with food. Uh, watching someone eat something delicious, watching their reaction, is almost as pleasurable as eating that food yourself. I think this is why watching people play video games on Twitch is so popular these days. Because I think that's a perfect example of desiring through the other. Kids these days aren't just playing video games, but they're watching people play video games and getting enjoyment through that. And so our desire does not arise from the object or any of its properties nor is it elicited from the object as it's imagined or idealized in our minds. Instead, the cause of our desire is found in the gap between the former and the latter, in the absence of a link between the two. The signifier institutes a lack at the center of our existence as subjects, and this lack is the condition of the possibility of desire. Absence is our animating force, our constant failure to obtain the object is what drives our desire for it. Not only that, but Lacan insists that desire isn't even our own, but the other's desire. And this brings us to Lacan's perhaps most significant contribution to psychoanalysis, Abjea. Lacan considered Abjea to be his most significant contribution to philosophy and psychoanalysis. Lacan coined the term Abjea to designate that absence, instituted by signification, gives rise to desire within the subject. Abjaya is the object cause of desire. Abjaya radically redefines the status of human desire and enjoyment because it rejects the common sense consumerist thinking that satisfaction is obtained through the presence of an object that desire is oriented by the presence of an obtainable, alluring object, that desire is a relationship to an existing object. Instead, psychoanalysis insists that desire is oriented to loss, to failure to obtain the object, that our relationship is oriented around an unattainable object, this object being the object cause of desire, or objea. We can think of Abjaya as a fundamentally lost object, an object which we are constantly searching for in everything around us. Abjaya is not a positive object which can be, potentially be weighed, touched, measured, and instead operates as a pure loss, a sort of negativity that nonetheless influences us. Todd McGowan describes Abjaya as a limit that constitutes our subjectivity. He states that the object is not an object that the subject hopes to obtain, but a limit that the subject encounters. The subject cannot overcome the limit 
but constitutes itself and its satisfaction through the limit. The subject seeks out what it cannot obtain and lashes itself to these objects. Its failure with regard to them provides a satisfaction that completely defies the capitalist image of reality. And so Ajaya is never a particular object, nor is it nothingness, but a step beyond nothingness, uh, an empty place, an absence. Hence, Lacan's Abjaya functioning as a sort of algebraic variable. We can think of Abjaya as a positive negativity, a positive lack, or a material embodiment of lack. Abjaya can also be thought of that which is in the object more than itself, or that special something which can come to inhabit stupid objects that don't satisfy any biological or practical need, yet we nonetheless desire. Lacan's assertion might be difficult to grasp at first because our conscious, egoic activity gives a false impression of how we desire. Consciously, we seek out success and satisfaction through winning or obtaining objects, and we regard failure as contingent and temporary rather than as a necessary condition of our subjectivity. Lack is always approached as a negative category which may be resolved by addition or by a presence. Unconsciously, however, lack asserts its positive force over us. We are constantly sabotaging ourselves, constantly repeating and relying on loss and failure to sustain our desire. A perfect example would be like video games. If a video game is too easy, you can't get any enjoyment from its playing like Saints Row 3. It's too easy of a game, it's not even fun. Whereas a game like Dark Souls is a game that's miserably hard and you, in which you enjoy the failure of trying and repeating over and over again. And then when you finally succeed, it's not satisfaction but relief. But you know, the enjoyment of the game is the constant failing. That's also the thing that I've found with skateboarding. People who really enjoy skateboarding don't enjoy successfully landing the trick. They enjoy the hours, weeks, years of failure that it takes to land that trick. Uh, and that's the constitutive lack at the heart of skateboarding. The, you know, the person who enjoys just landing the trick might enjoy like a skateboard video game on their phone, but real skateboarding would be miserable to them if they can't find a way to enjoy the falling. It's important to avoid the alluring conclusion that consistently failing to attain the trick or the object is what makes the obtaining of it, ulti the ultimate attaining of it, all that more sweet or all that more satisfying. The more nuanced or the more psychoanalytic interpretation is that it's the consistent failure itself which allows us to find the satisfaction or the consistent failure which gives us that satisfaction. We do everything we can not to confront the reality of this constitutive lack at the center of our being, to keep Abjaya at a distance so that it may continue to operate as the cause of our desires. This is where fantasy enters into the equation. Fantasy provides us a frame of coherency and consistency within which we can relate to objects and ourselves a scenario in which some privileged objects may come to relieve us of our lack. Through fantasy, lack is tolerable because it allows us to envision the lack we experience as contingent rather than necessary, and thus potentially resolvable. Fantasy fills the unbridgeable gap between the subject and Ajaya with an arbitrary privileged object, and through this comforting substitution, provides the coordinates to our desire or it tells us how to desire. But of course, fantasy is always just that, uh, a fantasy, and is doomed to failure. Yet, there is always another fantasy to save us from the disappointment and the traumatic recognition of our constitutive lack. Fantasy functions by effectively concealing its own impotence, its own impossibility. And, as we have mentioned, it is this concealed impotence that ignites our desire. Zizek, in his book Plague of Fantasies, articulates this point when he says, Fantasy mediates between the formal symbolic structure and the positivity of objects we encounter in reality. That is to say, 
provides a schema according to which certain positive objects in reality can function as objects of desire, filling in the empty places opened up by the formal symbolic structure. Zizek insists that fantasy is not the sort of illusion or distortion of reality, but that which gives us access to reality. Even the most rational viewpoints are, are in a sense, a type of fantasy which mediates our access to reality. Understanding Abjaya and the paradox of desire provides us with the key to understanding the allure of consumerism and its effective manipulation of desire. The fundamental structure of desire has not changed since the invention of language, but capitalism has a unique influence over our relationship to lack. Abjaya allows us to rethink capitalism, not as a system which produces an abundance of objects, but as a system which effectively produces lack, and is thus able to mold people into consumers, into subjects that desire many things. As privatization of our social lives intensifies, the language of marketing seems to saturate all discourse, and advertisements fill every empty space. We are fed fantasy after fantasy in rapid succession, always urging us to invest in possibilities of fulfillment through the purchasing of products. And yet the most successfully sold commodities are embodiments of lack. I think a perfect example of this are collectible items like Funko Pops or baseball cards or stamps. Yeah, like you said, a collector's desire is constantly being displaced from collectible to collectible. And if you ask a collector of Funko Pops or sneakers or stamps or cars or whatever, if you ask them, why do you collect these things? I think they have a hard time answering your question. Uh, they probably say that I like being surrounded by these things or I just like having them. But the explanation behind the collection is an elusive one. It's, it is always this sort of this special something, this X factor, which inspires that sort of compulsion to continue buying. And again, it doesn't have to be the Funko Pop or the sneakers, but I think everyone who is a consumer, everyone living in consumer society, has this tendency to collect. And I think it's nothing but the function of desire, a function of objet a, or this lost object which we think inhabits this or that object, yet once we obtain that object, it only becomes displaced to so yet another object. I think another perfect example of how Abjaya functions under capitalism is a lottery ticket. There is this sort of absence at the heart of all gambling mechanisms that drives them. The, the fantasy of success. This next pull of the slot machine, I will achieve Abjaya. And I think this is why Abjaya is often objects of addiction. This next hit of heroin will make me whole. And then you end up just, you're, you're constantly chasing that high. And what you're chasing is abjaya, this impossible object of, of desire, of satisfaction. And capitalism has done a really excellent job of hijacking this structure of desire to advance its own profits and ends. And so we have a society that is structured not around meeting human needs, but is instead structured around not satisfying people's desires, but producing artificial desires, producing, you know, the very dissatisfaction that it alleges that it can resolve. You know, freedom is the freedom to buy Funko Pops, not the freedom from homelessness. I think the society or the ideology or the system that we'd like to see replace capitalism, it continues to avow our constituent of lack, unlike capitalism, which suggests that we could ultimately be delivered from our lack through commodities or through abundance. This system, perhaps socialist or communist system, avows the lack and replaces this system of desire for commodities with a desire for a more collective project, a more radical project, a sustained object of desire. I think one, the one thing that capitalism is very good at is sort of breaking down and fragmenting our desire such that we are good consumers and such that we can desire 
a variety of commodities in rapid succession. And what capitalism avoids is an object of desire that is sustained throughout time. Capitalism is afraid of a sort of focusing in on an object. And of course, this, this focusing in can easily be a fascistic fantasy or a, an authoritarian fantasy. Nonetheless, that same sustained focus on an object or that sustained fantasy is what allows for a transgressive or radical project. And that is something that capitalism is so good at breaking down and fragmenting and displacing into a variety of objects. The only thing around which our desire circulates is these endless variety of commodities, which in turn sort of atomizes us and separates us from each other and forecloses any possibility for a collective act or a collective fantasy. Yeah, and I, I think that the goal of a radical politics or a leftist politics would, in restructuring society, would be to shift Abjaya from commodities to other people. Abjaya does not have to be the exclusive domain of capitalism. And so Abjaya can really help us understand how capitalism hijacks the, the very structures of how we desire to perpetuate itself ideologically and materially. If you like what you listen to, please like, share, and subscribe. This has been Death Drive Dialectics. I'm Nicholas Tolliver, here with Tyler Mraz. Thank you for listening. Peace.